Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson three of the platform-specific series of my 6502 programming tutorials. We're looking at various systems and how to do bitmap graphics on them, and this week it's time to look at the Apple II. Now, in the graphics mode we're using, the Apple II is quite interesting. It's kind of a two-color system, just black and white, and it's kind of a four-color system. And this isn't two different graphics modes that can do these two functions, it's the same mode. You see, depending on the positions that we plot our pixels, individual pixels may appear different colors because of analog distortion of the monitor system. These are sometimes called composite artifact colors, and as I say, it's actually a kind of distortion effect that we can exploit into making colors for us. Now, Despite it being an artifact, we can actually configure between two different palettes. So we use a single color bit per byte, and this will define the color of the remaining seven bits. And again, something unique to the Apple II is that seven bits within the byte define seven pixels. So we have a very odd screen resolution of 280 pixels wide by 192 pixels tall, rather than a normal 256 or 320. So the Apple II is quite strange. Now, because only seven bits of the byte define pixel color, we do need to make sure our bitmap data is in the correct format where we have colors defined if required, or if not, we just skip that bit. We can't just write two bit data straight to the screen. But as always, my AquaSprite editor does allow for colors to be configured for the Apple II. We can just go to here and we can change our settings and we can just select Apple for color here. And this will effectively halve the resolution. Now, this isn't a very good bitmap to be using here. I'll just load in the normal one. There we go. And this allows us to set the colors according to a, an Apple II screen. And we have a setting here to work in seven pixel wide blocks so that we can see how the bytes will be aligned. We also have the option using this alternate palette here, if we just find the Apple II one. There it is. So we can set the palette using the ZX Painter. So we can, you can see I've colored these palettes in here using the second palette. Now there are two palettes. One uses black, magenta, green, and white, and the other uses black, blue, orange, and white. So black and white are constant, and orange and blue are made up depending on the combinations of bits. And the way that works is if two neighboring bits are zeros, they will always appear black. If two neighboring bits are ones, they will always appear white. And you can see that here. But if the bits are a zero and a one, they will appear pink. And you can see that just here. But if they're in the opposite, or, combination, they will appear as green. Now that's with the color bit, the top bit, bit seven, zero. If we set it to a one, then we get other colors. You can see here, we've got the blue and we've got the orange on the clothing of Chibico here. So that's how we can define greens and magentas and oranges and blues. But as I say, my AcroSprite editor will do that for you. And we can just use the ZX Paint here and we can just color in blocks using either one of these two palettes here. And you can see, we can just drag the color along there. So that's how we can paint it in. And then when we want to export, we can just do an export using this option here, Apple II, and save either in two color or four color. And if we save in two color, we effectively ignore this color information. But if we save in four color, we're saving this here. Now, although I'm effectively halving the resolution here for this view, that's not necessary. It's just a simplification for, to allow me to program this more effectively. You could just as easily define this in spectrum color mode. And of course, this would view just in this way here. This is actually the same sprite you can probably see here. Uh, but AcuSprite Editor only supports the color attributes if you're working at half resolution. And that's just because it's so complicated to calculate it and view it on the screen. So it's, it's, it's only got basic support at the moment. But as I say, it's free and open source, so you can download it. And if you want to try and make it better, please go ahead. So we're using AcuSprite Editor to create the bitmap data we're going to be viewing today. And as I say, it's the same screen mode we're using in both cases. It's just the combination of bits that we're drawing to the screen depend on whether we're getting this display or this display here. Now, it's not only the bytes of the screen and the colors they represent that are a bit confusing on the Apple II. It's also the layout of the screen is a little bit tricky. Like a lot of screens, the lines aren't consecutively beneath each other. So if we have a line number in a Y coordinate and we want to work out the memory address of the far left of the screen, we need to calculate it based on various bits within the Y coordinates byte value. And effectively, if we think of the byte being individual bits and we split these into separate chunks here and we imagine this one being zero to seven, this one being to zero to seven and this one being zero to three, we can calculate the address by adding the starting address of the screen, which in our case is going to be hexadecimal 4,000. And then we add AA times hexadecimal 28, BBB, that's this section here, times hexadecimal 80, and CCC times hexadecimal 400. 
And as I say, CCC, BBB and AA would be values like 0 to 3, 0 to 7, things like that. And now we're going to see that actually in practical code so that we can see how we do this. But as I say, we do need to just understand that. Now, once we've calculated the Y line, everything's pretty straightforward. The first byte is the left hand side and every byte across is further to the right. But of course, when we get to the next line, unless the next line is, is in within an 8 pixel tall strip, we're going to need to completely recalculate this again because it's going to have quite heavily relocated. Now, that's kind of the pseudocode of how how we calculate the screen addresses but if you prefer I do have a memory map which I got from one of the technical documents. Now the screen is split into effectively three chunks so if you imagine this is 0 comma 0 on the far left and this is the bottom of the screen line 192. Now you can calculate the screen addresses depending on the line number within that chunk so the first third line 0 to 63 have these following addresses and so you can hopefully see that within an 8 pixel tall strip the addresses are kind of linear but then once we get to the ninth line it jumps back to the start again but now we're adding hexadecimal 80 here and that's where this calculation comes in so this is what we're effectively doing but this is what the actual memory addresses will appear like and you can see there's even some unused data there but as I say if you don't understand all of this you really don't need to worry because the formula I'm going to give you you can just call as a subroutine and it will calculate the memory address you want to work with that's the whole point of this I, I do like to explain how the theory works though because in my opinion that's the whole joy of playing with these old computers it's learning how theory works and being able to mess with it and learning how very different a system like the Apple II is compared to a system like the Atari for example which you know same kind of age same generation completely different screens completely different byte layouts of the pixel data and that's what's interesting about them to me Anyway, let's carry on. So the Apple II does have various screens, but we're going to be using the graphics screen today and we're going to be using it in position page two because that allocates the most memory to our program. Now, you could of course use the text screens as well, but I, my tutorials are really designed for programming games. So we're not going to be covering that today. When we want to set up the screen, we need to set a bunch of hardware registers. And usually again on the Apple II, there's something um, quite quirky. Most systems we would write values to certain memory locations or something like that. Simply the process of accessing those memory locations has the effect of setting the attributes on the Apple. So it doesn't seem to matter if we read or write or what value we write, just reading or writing to these locations will have the effect we want. So for example, if we want to set graphics mode, which we certainly do, we have to read or write from hexadecimal C050. And so we're doing that in the code here. We also need to set the full screen graphics. We need to set display page two to set the correct memory location, the hexadecimal 4000. And we need to set high res graphics mode by writing to CO57. And that's really all we need to do. That's everything that will get the graphics screen set up. So enough talk, let's have a look at the source code. So we're going to be using this bitmap test today and let's just see it running. So here's our Chibico character in two color. As I said before, there is no true two color and there's no true four color. You can see there's some color distortion here, but we're swapping the palette to the magenta one here. So you can see how we're doing things. Now, if I go up here, so when we want to use four color mode, we just rem out this option here and recompile. And you can see we've got our Chibico sprite in four colors now, but it's important to remember that everything else is the same. And in fact, there is no change to the screen mode or the source code with the exception of the bitmap sprite we're actually loading into memory. You can see here that we're loading in a different bitmap file here, but everything else in the code is identical. So that's how it works. Now, how do we actually get that bitmap onto the screen? Well, here's the code that does the work. We're using this get screen pos command to calculate the memory address of the data we need to write based on an XY coordinate. The X coordinate is in bytes and the Y coordinate is in lines. Now this is common to all of the systems we're covering in these tutorials. So what we're doing is we're calculating a memory address and it's being stored in the zero page label DE, which is a pair of bytes in the zero page. We're using HL as the source data for that bitmap. And then we're just copying bytes from HL to DE here. Now, once we've done a full line, we then use this get next line command. This within an eight pixel tall strip will calculate the next line. And the reason it only works within an eight pixel tall strip is if you remember, after eight Y lines, we have to start recalculating this section here, which is more complicated. So for simplicity, this is only working with an eight pixel chunk at the moment. Now, we're doing here a check to see if we're still within that eight line strip. If we're not, then we're jumping down to here and then we're actually recalculating the entirety of the address by using the get screen pos command here. We're jumping back up to here and doing a full recalculate. Now, of course, you could use get screen pos on every single line, 
and just replace this get next line and that would make the code simpler but it would make it a little bit slower so I've tried to do a bit of a trade-off here so that we're able to have most of the speed and most of the simplicity as well so get next line could be more advanced and could cope with the changing of the entire address but it doesn't in this case so let's have a look at the code we're actually using today then that does the calculations. So the first thing we should have a look at is screen in it. As I say, any read or write to these addresses seems to have the correct effect of changing the graphics modes. So as I said before, we're just displaying graphics mode. We're setting it full screen, selecting high res mode, and then we're setting the memory address to start at hexadecimal 4000. Now, of course, it's actually the get screen pause command that's doing all of the dirty work. So effectively, we're needing to split our Y location up into various chunks of bits and rotate them around to get the correct calculations we need. So first of all, we're going to use DE as our destination. Now the bottom bytes, we're going to start off at zero here. And then what we're doing is we're taking these three bits here, which are represented by B here, and we need to multiply this by hexadecimal 80. So we rotate this four times here, and we then rotate one of the bits into E. The three rotates will move to the far right hand side here, and the fourth one will push one of the bits into the E0 page entry here, so this is effectively multiplying it by hexadecimal 80. So that's what we do there. We're then adding hexadecimal 40 to the D0 page entry. This is effectively setting the start address of the screen because the screen's address starts at hexadecimal 4000. Now we're going to load a Y back in, and this Y time we're going to get the A part here. Now this needs to be multiplied by hexadecimal 28, but the way we're actually doing it is we are going to shift the bits off and use branches and add commands here. So we're shifting off the top bit to see if we're in the second third, and if we're not, then we're going to go here, and if we're going to shift another bit off and see if we're in the first third. So we're effectively shifting off these two bits one by one, and we're adding hexadecimal 28 or hexadecimal 50 to the E0 page entry, depending on which of the thirds we're in. So we've now done this part of the calculation. Now the final part is quite simple. We just need to multiply the C part bits here by four. So we're taking those three bits from our Y, and we're rotating them left twice, effectively multiplying them by four, and then we're adding them to D here, because this calculation needs to be hexadecimal 400, so we're adding them to the top zero page entry within our DE pair. We've now done all of the Y calculations, so the last thing to do is to take our X value and add it to E. Now we do have an additional addition here if this screen width 256 is defined. I use this within my games because I try and standardize on a 256 by 192 screen because that's common across most systems, but the, because the Apple II is a 280 by 192 screen, I do have to add a few bytes to centralize it. So that's just a sl slight change there. Finally, we've got our get next line command. This is just adding hexadecimal 400 just by increasing the D part of our pair. And this is effectively moving us down a line, provided only this part has changed, which is why we need to completely recalculate every eight lines. So there we go, a bit complicated, but you can see if we work through it, we can actually make it relatively straightforward. And as I say, if, if you're not clear on this, you really don't need to worry about it. You can just use this sample code as is, and hopefully that'll get you able to do some simple graphics on your game. Of course, there is an alternate version. This, this font here is also drawn with a similar version of the code, but that's designed to use a one bit per pixel font, and it's a common pixel font within all of my systems. We're not gonna cover that today because it's basically the same code, just regurgitated. So if you want to have a look at that, please go ahead. It's in the functions file v1functions.asm, but um, it's, it's not going to be something we're going to cover today because if you've understood what we've just seen, it's going to be pretty much more of the same. And if you haven't understood it, it's going to be probably too complex. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this. We're going to continue looking at the Apple II in future lessons, and we're going to look at more 6502 systems within these bitmap tutorials. Anyway, thanks for watching today, and goodbye.